Welcome to Emotionships, where we talk about the real reason everything happens for a reason. I'm your host, Charlie Carroll, along with my... I thought of another one the other day, and now it's... it's, it's well, this has definitely gone south. My uh, lovely co-host, oh. Mallory... Ooh. <laughs> Valerie Start over. Uh, Fourth of July edition, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Fourth oh. of July. Yeah. Celebrating oh, so much to talk about. Celebrating the birth of this country and what the founders' intentions were. Episode. Yes, this is episode. I know we both have an emotion ship with this one. Yes, episode 23. MJ, uh, the MJ app. The, the MJ episode, which I did get your lovely text last night about The Last Dance, yeah. episode seven. I have not seen it yet. Yeah. Well, you're just like, it, it's taking us a long time to plow through all these well, episodes. But here's the thing. It's true to the way, like, you've heard this story, how I handle my Christmas gifts. Oh, yes. You're savoring. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I don't open them all at one time and I go really slow because... <laughs> I could tell so many stories about this. I I literally have something I bought myself for Christmas from three years ago that's still in my closet that I've never opened. It still has the bow on it and everything. And what's so funny to me is you know what it is. I do know what it is. You bought it for yourself. But listen, if you don't open up your last gift, it's still Christmas. It's (laughs) not. Today, it's it's literally not Christmas. every, Every day is Christmas. That's what I tell people. That's why I can work on holidays and be okay with it because every day's Christmas to me, Mal. You're going to you're going to die and there's going to be all of those unopened gifts. How cool would that be if there were enough for everyone at the funeral? <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, right. But I did get your text about uh MJ and yeah, so we, I need to see that. We made it through ep- I think we were on episode 7 last night, which it was the first time we'd watched an episode in many weeks. Yeah, I think but that's my next episode. It's really good, and he talks about the cost of leadership at the end. That's why I wanted to know if you had seen it yet. Yeah. And he, Michael Jordan, got very emotional. There yeah. were tears. Unlike somebody I know, he's uh, able to produce tears. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're working that, on, that's one we're of working the, on your emotional expressions. Y- thank you. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things I really, really respect about Michael Jordan. I mean... You, you see him at Kobe's memorial service yeah, and just his ability to shed tears. And even when he was retiring, you know, all of the memes from oh, him, yeah. him crying and, oh, yeah. you know, he even laughs at himself when it comes to that. But you know, what's really interesting though, is this, in this episode, they go into his father's death okay. and, and Michael's like retirement, his first retirement and entrance into baseball, Yeah, which is, Total emotion shift. Total emotion shift. Like trying trying to reconnect to, to his yeah. dad. Yeah. I didn't realize when he was a that. Boy. Yeah. And so he says, you know, when he's retiring that well now it means that my dad got to see my last game that I played in basketball and then just the emotion tied to baseball that yeah. connected him to his dad. I had right. no idea. Well, his dad was a big baseball fan and, and got the boys, he and his brother, I believe Jeffrey Jordan, into uh baseball when they were little. And so when his father unexpectedly which always makes it worse yeah passes that was those were some of the emotions i mean by going back to baseball in essence he was going back to some of the best memories of his life Mm -hmm. which were his childhood Mm -hmm. and the connection between baseball and his dad yeah and he said that he had recently had a conversation before his dad passed with his dad about baseball about him playing baseball and his desire to play baseball so it makes perfect sense yeah and and the emotions the good memories you know when his his father passed and all of the questions that come with uh losing a parent uh would have energetically created and and stirred up as he was reminiscing and thinking about his father it would have taken him back to that and so moving toward that emotion or those feelings uh is what he was doing by trying to go back and, and play baseball again the real reason everything happens. Yes. For a reason. There, there is a real reason behind the scenes that is making everything happen, which my two go-to analogies with that come back to uh, when uh, you hit a golf ball, 
like it might go crazy hardcore to the right. And you're like, ah, oh, where in the world did that come from? You know, where did that come from? And that's what guys typically do uh, or, or women, but typically guys when they're golfing, like this ball that they're supposed to hit straight goes like crazy over to the right. Mm. And they're like, oh, how did that happen? And the answer is you made it happen. Right. Right. right? Now you might not understand how you made that happen. Uh, and the same is true with any other sport. Like the ball will only go where you make it go, whether you intend for that to happen or not. And so, you know, the idea of bringing up emotion ships and the importance of talking about these emotion ships is because they're the real drivers in life. And so when, when everyone is wondering why Jordan would step back at his in while he was in his prime and go in a different direction toward baseball, it was the deep connection to his father mm-hmm. from what, from when he was a child. Yeah. And so it is the real reason everything happens for a reason. We were, driving home last night from uh, a family gathering where one of my cousins from South Carolina came in town and uh, she asked if all of the cousins wanted to get together. So we had gotten together and and we're on our way home from that. And out of the back seat, uh, our daughter Kate said, "Uh, do you ever spend any time thinking about why they call barbecue barbecue? I love it. I love this. That's complete. That's totally the kind of kid that I was too. Yeah. Just, just it's like why she, she's letting it out of her mind. Yeah. That's right. Great. It, it's, uh, it was there in her mind. And, uh, do you know, Mm-mm. It, it actually, did you Google it? I did afterwards mm-hmm. because I was just wondering, because what we say on this podcast is words are nothing more than a series of shapes that we identify as letters put together to describe realities, but the words are never greater than now people can grow words to become greater than the reality, but often words fall short when it comes to fully articulating what's really going on and the power that is in that reality. Like communication and language is just an attempt to communicate realities. And, and what is easy to do is to make the communication of the reality bigger than the reality. Okay. And, and, and so sometimes, you know, some of the, the marital advice that I was given is when your wife is talking or she's stressed out and, and she wants to talk at the end of a long day, uh, the goal is not to solve her problems, yes. but just to listen. Yes. That she just wants to be heard. Her, she doesn't actually want her problems to be solved. She just wants to be heard. Yes. I would agree with that. Yeah. And so, so it, it just... Kate speaks up and says, Hey, have you ever spent any time? (laughs) Have you ever spent any time wondering why they call barbecue barbecue? And I thought, no, but it's actually a really good question. Not a bad question at all. And and so I looked it up. Uh, Barbecue comes from a Caribbean tribe uh, and their word barbacoa, which meant to uh, cook over a fire, over a wood fire, a wooden structure specifically. So, taint. Tanio Indians. I, yeah. Okay. So that, that's barbacoa. Interesting. It, it, it is where our word barbecue comes from. Yeah. Uh, pretty funny. Uh, we, we had Charlie's girlfriend with us. And so we, your son, yeah, my son, Charlie, and they were walking around the, the area that we were eating. Cause there's a mall there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we were taking her home on, um, on our way home and we ran into her parents as we were driving up into their neighborhood. And we had been over uh, at their house a week or so ago. And uh, he is from a Lebanese family. And so they made Lebanese food for us. And it was really, really good. Yeah, and we got to uh, tell them a story last night that after we left, so our kids had gone, you know, a week ago with us over to their house. Yeah. Uh, and we all got to experience this great Lebanese food. And so the next morning, because Amy and I eat a very specific way, which in the future more will be coming out about this, uh, but we eat with this focus of our mitochondria and, and the energy centers of our cells. So we have a lot of energy. And so we don't do uh, a tremendous amount of carbs. But when we go out like this, this is one of the two times a week that we'll splurge and have more carbs than normal. And so as the story goes, the next morning, uh, Amy said in front of the kids, I feel like I have a carb hangover. 
And Kate, once again, spoke up and said, well, do you think it's because of all that lesbian food you ate? Oh, (laughs) so close. Yeah. (laughs) And so now the joke is, is that uh, we went over and had had lesbian, le- had lesbian food. Yeah. Uh, Lebanese, ladies and gentlemen, Lebanese uh-huh. food, not lesbian food. Right. But we did get a good uh, laugh out of it. But it shows you uh, e- even even in that lighthearted uh, example that she was just using a word to try to communicate yeah. a reality. Right. Uh, which brings us to all that is going on in the world, in our world, uh, this July 3rd. Uh, it feels like the world is falling apart. It yes, that is accurate. Uh, it's, in some ways, yeah. In some ways, I I've, I've been I mean I've been thinking about this obviously a lot, and in some ways it feels like it's kind of a a breaking in order to to mend back together stronger. Yeah, that, that's a terrible way to describe. <laughs> Those words did not go very well together, but. In some ways, it does feel like it's falling apart, and sometimes it feel in some ways it feels like it's being put back together. It's just kind of there's like the labor pains of that. Yeah. Do you feel like the protests and all that we see culturally, um, the 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 cry for change? Do you think it's effective? Uh, in some ways, yeah. I mean, I think in some ways that this is kind of a an awakening. Yeah. For many people and organizations, and you know, you see. Um, There were a couple, I think Kristen Bell was one of them, a couple of actresses who were, um, they were doing the voice in an animated series. I, this is, I I know very little of the story, but I know enough to know that it's worth sharing. Um, they were doing the voices, her and somebody else for characters who were not white and they are white and they have since, um, relinquish their responsibilities, but you know, on their own, um, in order to, to give those jobs to actors of, of color, which I think that in that sort of way, I think it is, it is an awakening and it is helpful as people kind of come to realize how many people, particularly people of color, uh, have been marginalized and kind of pushed to the side. Yeah. My fear is that, like in most situations in life, that we that we kind of want to put our hands in the in the grass and massage things to look the way we want them to look and feel, but that we don't go deep enough to 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 change things where they need to be changed, which is at the foundation. Which what is that? What is the foundation? Well, I, I think that that's a really good question because I would follow up and, and to get there, I would ask the why question, like, why do these things matter? And that's what I guess I'm trying to articulate is I wonder how many uh, people have really gotten to the why when it comes to what what we're doing, what we're talking about, like, what's the why behind it? What's driving? There's always something driving the why. What, what's the why to it? Are you asking me? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's a group of people who have been, not only have felt, but have been, in my opinion, discriminated against Uh since, you know, you talk about the birth of our country. I mean, since then. And and there are ways that we, um, as white people, don't even realize that... um, they are being discriminated against that we are just it, it um so what what's the motivation for correcting it to not discriminate against a group of people okay so what's the motivation for that equality and equity and so what would you say is the motivation for that uh uh creating at getting as close as possible to the way that the Lord intends for people to exist together. Okay, great. So if someone doesn't believe in, we'll just use your words, right? Let's, let's just use words and try to disassociate all of the preconceived ideas or, or personal experiences okay. with the, those words put together, which is an attempt to describe a reality, right? Mm-hmm. The Lord. If someone doesn't believe in the Lord, 
what does the motivation then become? Um, or, or what do you think is, is, I mean, to put it like very uh, broadly peace that you, I, I don't that know you that think most people's motivation is, I don't is, know about most people, but I'm talking about people who don't have a worldview that incorporate, that includes God. I think peace is a, a idea that most people understand and are fits into their worldview, whether yeah. there's religion or not. Right. So when it comes to li- all of the things that we're seeing in the news here, like Princeton came out and said they're going to m- remove Woodrow Wilson's name from their maybe law school I- is what it was uh, because of his desire back in maybe the 50s uh, not to allow people of color into the school. Then we have Disney's Splash Mountain is going away because I guess that story was based on a folk tale that included uh, a black slave, maybe. Okay. Uh, we have Aunt Jemima. Uh, her family's in the news this morning. AP had an article wanting reparations for uh, the use of her on uh, the branding. Uh, John Wayne's son came out yesterday saying that John Wayne's words, uh, I think again, back in the fifties or sixties were taken out of context, uh, and that his name should not be removed from the airport. We've got your favorite, the Dixie chicks now just being called chicks. Chicks. Yes. Uh, rice Krispies. There's a petition out there because they're just three white boys is, is what it said, uh, to get them off of the cover the serial cover. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just wonder about these things and, and, and wonder what the, if we're going to go deep enough and, and get to the heart of the issue or whether or not we'll just be satisfied with pulling down statues that oftentimes I don't know that we know the significance of what was behind them or, or the story behind them or trying to just, Almost it's it's it almost feels like we're trying to take graffiti off of off of something versus addressing the feelings that created the graffiti. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think that's each that's a personal responsibility, right? To actually go deep. Um, I, I as a culture, we can do what we can to take everybody where to the root to yeah. kind of uncover and. Um, get get into the layers of it all, but I don't know that until each person takes responsibility for doing that work on their own, I don't know what it's going to look like. Well, th- I I think the great dilemma here is what is what should or what should the government's role be when it comes to morality and, and ethics and values. Because in some way, shape, or form, that's what we're talking about and what we're getting into. And so I, I think we're, if we could get down deep enough to it, what we're really going to run into is this collision where I, I feel like a lot of people want to be able to make their own decisions and say that you can't enforce your values on me, which, as we've said before, that's a way of enforcing your values on someone by telling them they can't enforce their values on you, right? You have a value that says you can't enforce your values on me, which there's just this mirror that when you, you do that, you're going to be guilty of it. And so I guess the question is, is when uh, we as a group of people, uh, whether it's a, a part of the country or it's a part of a city or, or the whole country at large, when we as people see things that could be damaging to others how do you how do you how do you respond in a way that is not enforcing uh your opinions and beliefs on someone on on a group of people yeah i i don't know should should the government be the the entity that is saying this is how you how you have to think and believe and Almost everyone would answer no, but then we turn right back around and say, here are the things that should be going on in government or should not be going on in government. And I think 
that's that's what some of the founders had in mind when they tried to set up a model that was the least amount of government as possible. But the problem is, as we started giving people the freedom and, and, and advocating for personal choice and the local churches uh, did not carry the weight in shaping uh, and growing people the way I think they should have, then it got to a place where people's personal agendas started to be detrimental to the society at large. And so when we see these things and behaviors that are detrimental to a larger group of people, then the question becomes what institution or, or who is going to shape our thoughts and our feelings and beliefs in order to curb that versus having the government coming in and saying, you can't think that way. You can't say that way. Well, if we believe in, in freedom and personal responsibility, how is it going to be effective to tell someone you can't think that way? And, and so almost in some ways, uh, it's something that we have to figure out, like, do you want to grow from the bottom up or the top down? I think history tells us from the top down, no matter what the ideology is, never works. Sure. What role is the government playing in the changes that you brought up? Well, I, I'm saying that if we start getting into um, let's let's protest or riot and uh, defund the police and everything that goes with all of the social unrest, right? The behavior assumes that the government can fix our problems, right? That, that we need to have other people elected in with other beliefs, or we need to take the model that we have now and get rid of it in order to raise up another government model in order to fix what the problem is. But it just comes back to, you know, most people out there would say like, um, I believe that I should have the right to make my own decisions for me and my life. And you should not be able to, uh, enforce your beliefs on me. Well, okay. Where does that stop? So if, if the, uh, white supremacist says, I don't think black lives matter and you can't tell me that I have to say they do, how do you balance that out? Where do you, where, where, where's the fix for that when it comes to government as the approach to fix these things? I mean, you can't fix, <laughs> you can't, I don't know that you can fix that if that's what a person is going to believe. I, th I mean, I think there has to be some balance, right? Like, I don't think I, I do not trust that the government is going to completely abolish racism. Yeah. Like that's just not ideal. If only it were that easy, it would have already happened. Um, but there is, in terms of like the protests and everything, in my opinion, there is some validity to it because like there is an authority, right? Like we do have, the government exists for a purpose. And so I think that there has, there is some, some balance there where I have to take personal responsibility and be a person who um, fights for and equality and, yeah. and, and d lives my life in a way that um, tries to make that a, a reality for people. And I exist in a society that has a government that I obey the laws that are that they set for me, right? I pay my taxes, I stop at stoplights and, you know, I, I follow rules. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I wonder w when it comes to talking about real change and uh, creating a different environment where someone is not discriminated against because of the color of their skin, I, I wonder where most people go with that when it comes to what is the real answer or solution here. Mm -hmm. and, and it just comes back to at the end of the day, you can't legislate morality and expect that the government is going to uh, do the work for us. And I think that's partially why we are in the situation that we are in. People expecting the government to do well uh, again, it, it's trying to figure out and, and balance and, and create an environment where 
people can make free choices, but I, I don't think we entertain enough what the other side of that is. If we believe in a person's right to their own beliefs and the way they want to live their life, well, what happens when, when there's an extremist on either side that says, here's the way I believe and you can't tell me that I can't believe otherwise. And, and, and so to me, it, it comes down to, we, we do have to acknowledge uh, if there is some higher power and greater standard that we're to all abide by or adhere to, which would prioritize the human life, no matter what the background, age, mm-hmm. sex, mm-hmm. ethnicity, mm-hmm. any of those things. Yeah. I mean, I do think that we're never, we're not going to reach a level of perfection. Right? Sure. Like we, the, the, it's just earth is not that, not that good. Um, but I do think with what's happening right now, it is raising a level of awareness that is allow. you know, we talk about awareness all the time on this podcast. And I think it, for many people, I believe that it is raising awareness that people have not had before. Like I've never thought about, you know, you talk about Kate asking about the word, the origin of the word barbecue. Like I've never thought about how and where Aunt Jemima came to be. And that is where I think that's that's why I feel confident in calling this sort of an awakening in many senses because I've never thought about that and I never had to. And now that I do think about things like that, it is it is raising a level of awareness of, oh, like that, I am existing within, uh, in many ways, a pretty racist system. Yeah. And, and I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is, with the reality of evil in the world, um, are are we? Do you think that the average person out there is is a is about change, and, and what are they trying to change? And and I'm a I just don't want, or I guess I'm fearful of, of falling short of saying here's what a real solution is. There's a difference between, and we see this a lot. Uh, and some of the work that we do, there's a difference between the person that just raises their hand and shakes their fist Mm -hmm. and says, I haven't been treated uh, fairly and and darn it, I deserve to be treated fairly. And the person that says, unfairness is a part of life. Let's look past that for a moment to see how do we, how do we affect and, and create real change to where now it's not just a personal thing where I feel like I have been neglected, but how do we, how do we prevent that from happening to people other than myself, to, to my children, to my grandchildren. And it's, and it's not to take attention away from, you know, in this situation, black lives matter, you know, that's not moving in a direction that says, well, all lives matter. So of course, black lives matter. No, again, it's the analogy of the house on fire. You move to the, toward the one that is on fire. But I just, I feel like we see a level of hypocrisy where we're shaking our fist at the government because as we said in episode 21, like we made gov- government the solution. So government is a problem, but we can't make government the solution because then it will become the problem again. Perfect example in, in my mind is like, this is your hometown. All of the people that are dying in Chicago on a regular basis, uh, through gun violence and I mean it was over a a dozen just in one weekend Mm -hmm. of people that are dying why aren't we doing anything about that why aren't we saying anything about that why aren't why aren't we trying to fix it and and obviously there are people trying to fix it but I, I I feel like it continues to exist and it's like yes we need to to give attention to whatever evil is in front of us right now but there is a larger context here that is creating and keeping this, these things going. And, uh, you know, my question is, are we taking the right steps to not be distracted by just what we see in front of us right now, but to move on to, okay, what's really going on here? And how do we, how do we make a lasting change and a lasting difference? Yeah. I mean, I think there are people that are trying to do that. Um, and it just, again, it gets, it's politicized, you know, sure. the second, is it the second amendment, the gun one? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are people that are very, uh, loud about their perspective on guns sure. on both sides. 
And I think that's super tied to what's happening in Chicago and, and, you know, violence anywhere else. And that, I mean, what do you think about that in terms of the government? Because that isn't, I mean, it's an amendment. It's well, that, that, or, uh, the Supreme court came out this morning with, um, the abortion case out of Louisiana, Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, in political talk, would be a, a victory for the left and a victory for abortion rights. We're, we're getting into the exact same situation, which comes down to what is the role of government when it comes to enforcing an overall general standard, right? Like what's the role of, of the government? And it just comes back to people want to kick and scream and say, well, this is my life and this is my truth. And you can't tell me otherwise, which again is, enforcing their truth on someone else. But at the end of the day, that has to happen in in some way, shape or form for a large group of people right. to exist together. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, I'm not, you know, again, it comes back to uh, abortion rights and when is a human being a human being or, or um, when does life exist and who gets to make that call? And so let's just say that it, it is murder if the baby has a heartbeat and it is murder. Who's making that standard and who's going to enforce that standard? And, and again, I think what the founders wanted to do in this country was create uh, an operating system or a platform by which the church could grow people into mature thinking positions about the sanctity of life, et cetera, and not have the government being the final say so in these things. Same thing with the second amendment, you know, uh, here we are, uh, getting ready to celebrate our country's birth, uh, and, and what it stands for. And we're, we're going through a phase in time that I don't think historically people understand and can appreciate history. The government of the United States of America is a is a living being in that living beings are the ones running it and driving it. Mm-hmm. We're we're still very young, but it's it's crazy for the anti American sediment inside of this country because of how young we are and you can only deal with things as you grow and evolve and see them. And, and so uh yeah, some of our founding fathers had slaves and um but like we said on another podcast this country is the country that pioneered saying slaves are not right it's not acceptable it's not okay we need to go in a different direction but but what you see with the general the sediment of the general public is that why have we done this well we have been used to change what the norm used to be and so does does them will the american government be imperfect of course because it's ran by imperfect people and that's that's not different than the question about churches churches are ran by imperfect people so they will always be imperfect but that just because our government is ran by imperfect people and certain people get elected through the process that we have set up uh, for elections doesn't mean that our government is not uh, the leader when it comes to humanitarian work and um, moving toward the least of these compared to uh, the large majority of all other countries. Like the good that we do um, far outweighs the bad that exists. But when you look at the good or the bad, it really is going to come down or, or come back to the individuals that are driving it. And so when, so you know, if you said the chicken or the egg, it's people that lead the government and then the government ends up leading people, but it still starts with people. And so what I'm, what I'm maybe being an advocate for or trying to be an advocate for here is realizing that it starts with the human heart and it starts with trying to go in that direction. And when you change the human heart, you change the ability to change the government for the right reasons uh, not just manipulating change. And sometimes you have to start at the top and try to make a quick change and then let the heart catch up. But by and large, I, I think what we want to do is figure out ways to say, why do we believe what we believe? Why do we believe that black lives matter? Right? Like just in this specific instance, 
can the average person answer that question? And are they willing to live up to or do their best to live up to the driving force behind why we answer those questions or, or why we would answer the question the way that we do? Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, just answering the average person, why do you know, blue lives or black lives or white lives. Like I don't want to limit it just to black lives, but that's the immediate context. Why do they matter? And and if you say that because every life is important, are you willing to live up to that and get behind that and, and let that be reflected in how you feel about everyone, not just this specific instance? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because we are coming at this conversation and every conversation with our particular experiences and worldview and all of that. And so I keep that in mind, even when you're saying like that the good that the government, our government does far outweighs the bad for some people that doesn't feel true. Sure. And so it's easy to me, it's easy for us to say that. And yet, um, some people might be listening saying, no way. Like I am, that is not my experience in this country at all. And I think that's important to, um, remember as we, you know, as we celebrate the birth of our country, when black people were not considered a full person, like they weren't counted as a full person. Um, and so I think in, in all of this, it's important to remember that my experience as a white woman in this country is vastly different than your experience as a white man or, you know, any, you know, many other um, differences that, that impact how we are experiencing the government. Sure. And our society. I just think that's important to, to mention that maybe on paper, the country, the, our country has, done a lot of good, but there's a lot of harm that's being done as well. Yeah. What do you mean? Can you break down a lot? Where do you see that ratio being? Well, I mean, if you are uh, Brianna Taylor's mother right now, mm-hmm. there's not a whole lot that the country is doing that's good for you, right? I mean, her she was murdered in her home and her by police officers and they are, I mean, most of them are still on paid leave right now. Yeah. Um, there's not much justice. And so I, I I would, I would imagine if I were Breonna Taylor's mom, I don't really care what we're doing overseas for other countries when, um, my daughter has been taken from me and nobody seems to be doing anything about it. Do you feel like that's a, Do you feel, so again, obviously none of these things are right. I guess my question is, where do we go from here? What, what, what's the, what's the emphasis, um, as as to where we go from here and who do we allow ourselves to make the bad guy? Say that. Who, who do we way? who do we allow ourselves to to make the bad guy or, or or the culprit in this situation? What are you trying to say? Can you say what you're trying to say? Because I don't. Know I how mean, to that's that's that that's that's what I'm trying to say. Is just is it police officers? Is it white people? Like I don't know that there has. To, well, I'm not grouping. I'm not making a group of people bad. I'm, sure. and I don't know. I think that's part of the problem is sure. that that is the question is who's the bad guy here? Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's a helpful question. I think people need to be held accountable for their actions. Um, and so if I kill someone, there needs to be uh, something that happens to me. Sure. <laughs> there has to be a repercussion. Um, and so I don't. So, so when there's injustice, uh, in law enforcement, uh, in the court system. Uh, again, I guess my question is, where do we go from here? And, and what is the quickest way to make real change so fewer people experience these injustices? 
I mean, I think that I don't know that they're, I think we're doing it. I think, I think that is part of even just having these conversations is that uh, we feel hopefully there is a sense of urgency for what is wrong to be made right. And I do think that some of it probably has to do with the government. I mean, they, they are our authority. Um, but I also think it's people doing their own, um, I keep saying their own work because that's sort of like the language that people use just in, in how, how am I helping to perpetuate a system that is not good for everybody or that is harmful to some. Not that it's always going to be perfect for everybody. That's just not, that's not real, I don't think. Um, but it certainly has to be made better. Yeah. And I, if I knew the answer, I, f- I would probably be making a lot more money than I'm making. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I think bringing to light what is dark yeah. has to be helpful. It has to be. We can't just keep living by sweeping things under the rug. Yeah, I don't think we should sweep things under the rug. I think the only thing that could be worse is getting obsessed with uh, changing the way things look by uh, maybe uh, creating political or, or government policy, but yet never addressing the heart of the issue and how do you how do you help people work through whether it's their trauma or their ignorance or or what have you like how do we help change it on a heart level uh, in conjunction with on a on a political level but it's just if, if government's going to be the solution it's always going to be the problem like we can't look to government to change these uh, issues for us because there's going to be a balance and you know I, I think this is what people wrestle wrestle with and try to figure out like where does it stop you know wh- when it comes to government modifying or, or legislating behavior and, and morality like where does that start and where does that stop and at the same time we want to cry and say well you can't tell me how to think and how to believe well it's not as if everyone is a robot and everyone is either healthy or un- unhealthy and they're easy to identify where, where does it stop when you have a person that is unhealthy from a relational standpoint or their views uh, are not healthy for a group of people or anyone outside of their own life? Where, like, you, you can't say that just because you feel like you're healthy and, and you can be a, a positive a contributor to society in a positive way that you deserve these rights and everybody deserves these rights because then what do we do with the person that is that is unhealthy no matter what the color of their skin is and they view or, or their worldview or beliefs accept or tolerate uh, judgment against another person or acts of injustice because of the color of their skin and and, and so I think if people would step back and a look at the the age of our of our society like we inherited thousands of years of history and, and what i think we did right was what the founding fathers did right was create an operating system or an environment where hopefully the people would have the ability to make choices out of who they are to be and to con, you know to to try to be an environment or community that that prefers life over death and prefers others uh, over themselves, and ultimately uh, take all of the politics out of it and some of the ignorance uh, where people don't know how to separate things that were written for certain periods of time and where society was at that time. Like the Judeo Christian, at its core, the Judeo Christian value is prefer other people over yourself, love your neighbor as yourself that is the only way for a group of people two or larger to actually exist and be healthy Mm -hmm. it is literally learning to put the other person's need in front of your own if we all did that we would be in a much better place sure what is the responsibility of each and every person when it comes to putting other people's needs in front of their own but like you said it still is going to come down to at some point in time, 
government has to say that at this point in time, you can't, you cannot say that your need is more important uh, or a greater priority than the other person's need. Or, sorry, you can't enforce that belief of yours on somebody else. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's, that is the ticket, right? And it sounds so, um, even as you said it, like, we need to prefer other people above ourselves and love other people. It sounds so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. But like, what's the actual answer? Right. Like, that's what I want to say. That's what I, that's how I want to react. And yet that's really the, that is the way that is, that is the way that's what, that's what is needed. And, um, it's so hard. Yeah. (laughs) It's so hard. It sounds so simple, but it's so hard. And I mean, how do we in, in, within a a society that has a government that is creating laws and mandates and all of that uh, to still just love another person and prefer their needs. I mean, I, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if that's where some of the protesting um, is coming from is, is, anger or whatever the emotion that the government is not preferring some people over is that is not doing a very good job of of that yeah love well okay but it still comes back to and this is why i keep harping on it the government is led by people that are on some scale of healthy to unhealthy Mm -hmm. And, and i think what we struggle to acknowledge is just because you've been elected to some certain position doesn't mean that you're necessarily healthy. And then the real question behind that, if you keep tracing it would be what does healthy look like? And then you get into the question of, well, healthy is an opinion. If we're going to have this narrative of, of life being important, well then what's that look like and and what is the role how what's a healthy person look like what are the qualities of a healthy person and what context does someone have to be raised in in order to to experience or become that healthy person like um in a a lot of the areas that we uh, are, are with our poverty alleviation community like the the behaviors and in the entertainment that are put in front of us as individuals does not promote healthy values. And in this case, what a healthy value would be preferring another person, right? Putting another person's in needs in front of your own. And I think often the, the content and the entertainment that, that sells is content and entertainment that speaks to the emotions that people felt when they weren't being treated that way. And so where does it start and where does it stop when it comes to our responsibility? You know, um, there's a lot of incredible art. And when I say art, it is people uh, developing creative ways to articulate their experience. There's a lot of crazy, good, like well done art that comes out of like uh, a black man or a black woman's experience and what they felt like when they were raised in a project, right? Just the way they, them versus the world or what their mother had to do or what they had to do to get out of that. Mm -hmm. Well, the more people that go through that situation, the more they relate to that. And in some ways it can be hard not to get stuck there that the world is against me. And so I'm going to have my own back and I'm going to watch out for the person that's going to try to take life from me. I, I think often we want to just boil it down to some simple equation, but it comes back. It, it's much deeper than that. Sure. I wonder if, um, if we really take it, I mean, you can't, you can't just completely check out from the government, right? Like, yeah, it, I, I believe that there, there is a need for us to remain involved in, you know, voting. I think sure. we should all vote. Sure. Um, but I wonder, you know, if we really took it seriously, what our, if our vote would change based on this call to prefer the other person. Sure. I don't know. Like, this is, I'm just wondering because, you know, I've talked about this with you before. I know you, you've heard me talk about just my experience with health insurance. Sure. Right? Like, 
it's been a, it's a nightmare. My, my experience with health insurance has been a nightmare. It's been thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for my family. Uh, and so what, so if I'm preferring another person, I wonder come November, do I vote for myself or do I vote for other people? And does, is that vote different? Sure. You know, I don't know. I have no idea. I haven't thought about it that much, but I think we all vote for ourselves, right? Sure. Like what's going to be the best for my family financially and my business and my health and all of that. Uh, but I'm curious if we really thought about it and we really thought about loving another person, if our vote would change. Sure. Which comes down to a general uh, belief as to which approach, whether it be right or left, conservative or liberal works. Uh, and, and what does the word works mean mm-hmm. and so we to to many of us loving and preferring the other person looks different sure maybe that's part of the problem yeah uh well i mean again getting back to the abortion issue you know you ask 10 people their opinion and there's going to be 10 different opinions as to what is the government's role when it comes to uh, abortion and and where does a woman's power begin and end when it comes to what is going on in her body even if that is going to become another person's life right and and what you're saying is at some point in time government has to have some sort of say so in that situation but you know it's it's interesting looking at Jesus the the teacher and thinking about what he would have said as to where that that role starts and stops. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Same thing with the Second Amendment. Yeah. Just again, you know, the context of the Second Amendment is the the individuals that make the country the country or the the government the government. Like we have the right to defend ourselves against a government that gets too big and tries to enforce its values on us. Mm -hmm. And there are very few politicians. No, I'll take that back. I want to get away from those words. We have seen a lot of politicians that have used politics for their own benefit versus the benefit of other people. We know that they're going to be imperfect, but whether it be abortion or the second amendment, there are a lot deeper questions that have to be answered when it comes to what should a person's right be when it comes to obtaining uh, an automatic rifle or, or or a high powered firearm. Mm -hmm. If you, if you were just black and white and very literal, you would say that the original intent of the second amendment was for individuals to have the right to have whatever firearm the government's going to have. So if the government is going to have a fully automatic firearm, then the individual should be able to do the same thing in order to protect themselves against a government that becomes too big and too interested in its own agenda, which at the time would be whatever that ruling group of people uh, are doing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you stop there and make that black and white, what you throw out or get rid of is uh, if people can be at all varying levels on a health scale, right? Like somebody can be struggling with mental health issues or they're full of hate and anger and rage because of how they were raised or what they inherited from a belief system. Uh, Do they still have the same rights as quote unquote, a healthy person and who has the say so on as to whether or not that person is really healthy. Right. So I I don't think it's as black and white as we want to make it. And my, my fear is that in trying to make it very black and white, we're doing that because we just want to make yes and no. The, the switch is either on or it's off type of decisions. But the health of, of our nation is not going to begin or end with just making black and white policies that say it's either yes or it's no. Sure, of course. Humanity is not that simple. It's not that easy. Mm-hmm. I think for, for us, it gets back to what is... What is our individual responsibility to be the light and the justice that we want to see in the world? You'll get a thousand answers if you get into the Second Amendment and and abortion rights as to where the government should land on that.
But if we're all preferring the other person and loving the other person, you probably don't need a semi-automatic rifle. Sure. Sure. In a perfect world. Yeah. Uh, did you see the the AP story of the 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 gentleman and his wife that? Yes. St. Louis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got out on their front porch. Yeah, I saw that. And just super super interesting that you know they came out. They have a spokesperson for the family that released um, a statement saying they they believe Black Lives Matter, but they could not trust who was in the crowd coming toward their house, and so they they pulled the firearms. Yeah, I have <laughs> a lot of thoughts on that, but. Um, do you think they were wrong for pulling out those the the firearms to defend themselves in light in light of what has been seen in all across the country? Uh, what would you have done? Well, I don't own a firearm, so I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, I guess maybe I don't know enough of the story. Was were things being done to their property? Well, or people were just walking by. He had some sort of influential position. They're both lawyers, and so he's a injury lawyer, from from what I understand. And I don't know how he got singled out, and whether or not they were just marching by, and he got fearful that they were going to damage his property because he's a known figure in the community. I don't know exactly, but to some extent he, they felt threatened and went and got, I mean, she, she even has her handgun out standing yes, on the front right. porch. I mean, maybe if I had a multi-million dollar home that I wanted to protect, I don't, I, I cannot imagine a, a scenario when I would, where I would have, just stood out on my lawn with a semi-automatic rifle or a handgun or I don't know how that was helpful. Yeah. Well, again, it gets back to the spirit and the heart of what right do they have to defend their own property and what they feel like they've built over a period of years. And I think what we're always going to get back to is where is the line between an individual's right and responsibility and what do they forfeit when it comes to being part of a larger community? Yeah. I mean, what, what would you have done? Um, hopefully, I would have had a better understanding of, of what was going on if, if this was going to go right in front of my house. Um, I definitely would not have stepped out with a firearm, uh, even though I do have firearms. I would not have start stepped out there with a firearm to intimidate anyone because the reality of it, though it might have worked in his situation, um, is you should never pull out a firearm if you do not intend to use it. Mm -hmm. And, and even if, as long as my family was going to be okay, or I did not feel like my family was under immediate threat or that we could not just, you know, lock the doors or whatever it is and leave, I would not pull out a firearm because that would, basically call my bluff and say, are you willing to do that? And it would have to be a very threatening situation in order for me to, to pull out a firearm and basically invite people to call my bluff as to whether or not I was going to use it because in a crowd of any size or group of people, not all people are created equal and not everybody is in the same place when it comes to, uh, health and wholeness and how they see the world and whether or not, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're, you're white or black, there are triggering events in anyone's life when they lose a job or they feel like they're not going to have a next meal that can cause them to do irrational things. Mm -hmm. And so I would not have gone out there and basically created a, a scenario where I could put my family in, in further jeopardy. Yeah. Episode. What are you feeling right now? What am I feeling? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think what I'm trying to do is, is work through myself as to how can we create practical ways for people to feel like they're contributing and making a positive difference versus putting weight and energy into something that's not going to go anywhere. So how does that feel in your body? It feels heavy, I would say. Yeah, I feel like sick. Yeah. In this conversation. Well, I, it's, 
it's difficult. You know, what I'm passionate about is, you know, not allowing these things to become some systemic hypocrisy where we just want to fix one situation versus like, how do we make this a, a, a real movement that doesn't want to put a face on it and just say, as long if they were gone, this would all be, this would all be done. Mm-hmm. These things have existed in large throughout all of mankind and humanity. Mm-hmm. And never has there been a time like today where we can hear it and see it. Right. And, and I think that was that Will Smith tweet, like not only has discrimination, but hate and anger and, you know, uh, sexual abuse, these things have been going on since the beginning of time and we just can see and hear them now more than ever before. Are we really, uh, interested in getting rid of the manifestations of selfishness or is this just going to be one situation where we say, well, injustice is, is horrible and people deserve not to experience those thoughts and feelings. Well, of course people should not be experiencing and feeling those things, but it's not going to stop. Like that's not the root. Uh, it's, it's a manifestation of other things that create other things. It's a manifestation of selfishness and, and, and hatred and, and evil. And those things are producing a lot of other things in the world as well. And so how do we, how do we not stop with just calling these things out or changing a, a syrup label or a, a box of cereal and instead get to a place where we can acknowledge here are the values that are best for our community. And here is, uh, here's why I'm going to adhere to that for the right reasons. Do you think it's unhelpful, the, like the Aunt Jemima, st- like that stuff? Well, I, I definitely believe that the good can become an enemy of the best if we settle for the good and, and we don't actually fix it. Um, I, w- I would say I would not, if I were, I think Quaker Oats, I think maybe is the brand mm-hmm. that, that owns that. Mm-hmm. I, I would just say that it's their responsibility to go to the family and say, what, what do you think about this? From what I understand back in the day, uh, Aunt Jemima was hired help. Um, and her cooking ability earned the right to where they made a brand or, or a label out of this. I don't know the history well enough, uh, but I would say that would be the family's decision as to whether or not her face needed to now, I don't know if you saw the original label. They they showed an original label, which is t- entirely different than what's on there now. And I, I don't know when they changed that. Mm-hmm. But if the family felt like it was honorable and it was a landmark for something that that was just put up there because of how good she was at what she did, I would probably lean toward, if I were the company, going to the family and saying, what do you think about this and what do you want? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, I don't think it helps just to point out the manifestation of what's bad. I think that's a part of the overall strategy, but are we willing, um, are we willing to go deeper and further and say, actually, here's the root of those things. And let's, let's see how we can address it throughout our community, hopefully to slow it down or or to try to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it could be helpful that, um, these nationwide companies are making such huge shifts is even just the conversation it stirs. Sure. You know, my kids aren't old enough to understand what's happening, but if they ask me, mom, why is there no longer an Aunt Jemima? Uh, that could be a really powerful conversation. And how would you answer that? I, I, well, like you said, I don't know enough about the, the history of how that product line came to be. But yeah. um, if Aunt Jemima was, a, a slave or you know what I would I mean I would share the history of it sure. and why it felt to a people group like it was um discriminatory or racially charged or um you know I would obviously do my research and then and try to explain to her how it made an entire people group feel it was celebrating and I think that's what a lot of these things in my opinion are doing is they're celebrating um I mean racism or 
slavery. Do you think Aunt Jemima was celebrating? Do you think that label was celebrating racism? I don't know the story. I, I mean, I, I, if she was a slave, or whatever her situation was, it certainly is, uh, well, not certainly. It feels like it would be uh, celebrating or promoting whatever the circumstance was if they're making, continuing to make money off of the story that she was living. Interesting question. When would the word outgrow the reality? Like what our, con- what our country inherited, <clears throat> which obviously is not the Lord's, if the Lord is the ultimate standard, is not the Lord's way, uh, those slaves existed in biblical times. When does slavery become slavery? You know what I'm saying? Like, again, uh, if you go back to my great grandmother when she was a child being raised in Mississippi, uh, what she said was that they were they were the black hired help were a part of the family and were around literally she was raised as a child with someone in the home that helped with the cleaning and the cooking and was a lifelong friend until that person passed away. Yeah. I mean, I think if you read, I mean, there's several accounts that that was not the case. Oh, right? of I course. Mean, these people were of not, course. they were not part of the family. They were of course abused. And oh, no doubt. No doubt about it. So what is the question? Just at what point in time would, and that's going for back further because if that was my great grandmother's situation, this would have been in the the twenties and thirties. Uh, and obviously even in that time, that wasn't the case. But again, it just comes back to the word slavery carries and is charged with much more emotion than some of the reality underneath it. Because even going back to, to, uh, other countries and a hundred years ago in, in some ways it was just like employment, right? In some cases. And obviously that's not all cases. It was like, so then where's that line there when someone is treated with dignity and humanity and left with assets and, and moves in and all of that stuff. Like there's just, I, I think it comes back to, there's so much to it that we always want to just try to boil down to one word and one feeling and make a sweeping change through a legislative pen, which would alleviate us of our own responsibility to be the light, life, love, and justice we want to see in the world. I mean, I, I continue to go back to how, and I know that you hate, you hate this and you'll push back on it, but I mean, the, the government said that black people are not considered full people. Um, so yeah, that, sure. that to me is, that's kind of all that I need to know. If there sure. were some scenarios where black people felt loved and um, a part of the family, then that's, I mean, that's good. That's great. But as a whole, uh, that I don't know that that was the case. Well, the government based their principles and laws off of what they inherited. And so just like you and me leading a business or leading a group of people, you always start with what you were given and then are given an opportunity through pursuing people to grow and change. And I think that's what we see. And there's always resistance to healthy, good change that you inherit a set of beliefs from your family and then moving out or or going away for whatever reason it is, you have the ability to see the world for yourself and say what changes need to be made in order to be a better version of ourselves or to live closer to this standard of truth, which is that which, which adheres to the facts. And so to me, it just comes back to, again, there's not a simple, clear answer that this is what the government intended from the beginning and then has tried to maintain this whole time. Because I think what you see is we, we've had great people that have come along and whether it's with slavery and racism or other things, just a, like even women's rights, like shouldn't we be questioning this? Like this doesn't seeming like it should be right or acceptable anymore. Like what do we need to do to change this? And what kind of environment had to be created in order to get down into these deeper questions and say, is this acceptable? We, we are the country that led the way with saying, this isn't, this isn't acceptable and we need to reconsider our ways. However, because a lot of people at large inherited 
a DNA and a mindset that said, this is okay. There has been resistance to that. And that's why it is in, in small ways still systemic is because we're trying to, in a 200 and some year history, overcome thousands of years of precedence where based on the resources I had or what my last name was or my proximity to a person in power, I had more rights than you did. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the fastest way to change what we inherited is by starting with the heart that eventually gets to government through people to say it, it's the preference of the other person and their needs above my own. Not easy. No, not at all. Ladies and gentlemen, episode 23. MJ. We'll see you next time. Yes.